Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Jet Rails podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about omnichannel commerce and breaking down silos, how you can really uh, interconnect uh, systems and really live where your customers want you to be. Um, it's a topic that we've certainly uh, touched on before, but today I, I have, uh, an, as always, an interesting guest. We have Anil from Hot Wax, and we're going to hear about um, how some of the latest technology is shaping up around uh, e-commerce and, and just commerce users in general that have this need of what we might refer to these days as unified commerce. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Anil, would you do the honors of introducing yourself? Hey, thanks, Robert. Yeah, this is great. Uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, for sharing my thoughts here at this podcast. It's definitely, you know, I've been following your podcast for some time now, and it's interesting. I, every time you have something really cool happening. Well, um, I'm Anil Patel from Hot Wax, and we have a good long history, and uh, I can talk about it for an hour, but I know that is the worst thing I can do. So let me uh, give you a brief. Uh, we have a background in open source community, because that's where our culture comes from. Uh, call. So we are the active contributor of, there's an open source project called Apache OFS. Um, and uh, we started by delivering a building and then delivering solutions on Apache OFS. Um, as we moved forward, we've seen two critical things almost all of our customer really cared for. Number one was time to market, and number two was total cost of ownership. And that is what moved us up. And with time, we, we uh, to address to this exact uh, requirement of our customers, we have created this product. And now we are focusing on Hotwax Commerce. Uh, it's an omnichannel uh, order management system that helps retailers uh, run their business for today's customers. That's uh, always glad to chat with someone that uh, has a love for the open source community, especially I, I suppose you must be one of the three people that tunes into this. So, I mean, there's me and there's uh, I think maybe one of my coworkers and, and you. So at least we know that three people are listening. <laughs> 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 no, nah, it's uh, it's a labor of love finding um, finding awesome guests and being able to bring information forward that people just uh, don't always get exposed to. You know, I, I oversee partnerships here at Jet Rails, and so I get to chat with all sorts of experts in the industry, and I get their insights, and that's sort of how the podcast started. It was like, uh, you know, I, I get privy to all this information that everyone else really should know about. <laughs> <laughs> How do we bring that forward? Um, so, right. you know, so much for NDAs. I'm taking all the partner info and just, you know, helping partners throw it out there and um, share what their experiences and insights are. So you started with, with Apache OF Biz, and that's been a, a labor of love for many years for you. Um, right. and, and that software is mainly used uh, as more of an open source ERP, or how would you classify uh, that particular suite? Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's always a challenging question, actually, because Apache Wolf Biz is like a two layers. One is the foundation, which helps you build the you know uh, enterprise applications. And then on top of it, there are like universal data model, which allows you to address to your you know business automation, I would say, to be more generic. Because a lot of times when we say ERP, people are thinking in terms of accounting, and you know, sometimes it's like MRP. It's it's very confusing terms. I've had challenging times even uh, when I'm talking to a Gartner analyst. Like everybody <laughs> defines ERP differently. So so I I, I want to stay well, away from that term ERP. But yes, you could do ecom like early days, like in 2003 time, two, 2002 time frame. I first got introduced to Apache Off Base because of uh, its uh, use in ecom. But then since then, we have grown, uh, the project has grown, and we have implemented Apache OFBIS for many different uh, players, different industries. So yes, it can be used for automating pretty much anything and everything in your business, including CRM, your manufacturing, your warehouse, order management, like you name it. I can give you a one, for sure, one big client that you would know who has used OFBIS in certain way. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, it's it's, it's pretty 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 good a product. Yeah, so it's and, it's uh, adaptable, and you know we find that I uh-huh. suppose there are those softwares out there that it is tough to you know wrap up and you know put a nice neat bow and say it's it's in exactly this column uh, just for that reason. Different people use it different ways. Um, you could even say that of you know other open source products like WordPress. Is it blog software? Exactly. Is it a content management system? Uh, is it or Drupal for that matter? You know, is it um, you know uh, an e-commerce platform? Uh, you know, when you add on different things or you know a, a magazine or, or news platform, and the list goes on and on for the ways that it can be adapted and, and used uh, internally or externally facing the world. You know, exposed exactly. to the world. Uh, so I, I'm with you, and I think that it is interesting that there are some platforms out there that you know have really boxed themselves in through the years and you know you meet a merchant that oh i'm using this erp but it's really not good at this thing that i needed to do and you know it's Mm -hmm. uh it's not open source i can't do anything about that so whether it's the inventory management the warehouse management the order management um you know there's a lot of managements (laughs) you (laughs) you really need over time right you know it keeps going and going so when hot wax started to come about, what were the the core systems that really you wanted to make sure that the hot wax platform would be able to handle? Uh, I, I know we've mentioned uh, e-commerce mm-hmm. and uh, and order management. Um, a- anything else that was really high on the target list based upon what you found uh, the industry was looking for? Yeah, this is uh, yeah. So so you know, uh, I had to confess here. I come from the engineering background, right? So it's really always I want to do this, I want to do this. So I'm like you know, um, with Apache Office Foundation, I'm like, uh, it's like being a kid in the toy store. So you want to get uh, do all those things, and when you go talk to a customer, they have so many needs you want to address to that all. But then to be successful, it is critical that you choose something that aligns well with yourself and your clients right so that's why you know after doing a lot of different things over the years finally we have settled on um, order to cash workflow so i would say capturing the order taking it through the fulfillment process and fulfilling the order now when we address to this need it's important for us it was super important that now we are doing it perfectly for example like you know uh, I'll come to this later, but yeah, the thing is like, you know, uh, because we are doing it with the fulfillment. So that's why, you know, uh, the system is way more addressing to the business needs because you are capturing order and you want to fulfill it. Mm-hmm. So that is why, you know, we, uh, when we were designing our system, we designed it with that in mind. And that's why, you know, we do commerce for capturing and then distributed order management for order rounding. And then, you know, you need inventory management. Uh, so you have point of sale systems uh, that, again, are order capturing and fulfilling systems. So you have POS and then you have inventory management system. So all these four pieces. Uh, so like you can draw board lines between all these, uh, you know, four pieces. Like you could say e for order capturing and then, you know, order routing and then inventory management and mobile point of sale system. So point of sale systems, basically. That's so really those are the you know key pieces. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know that platforms like Shopify have capitalized on the SMB market when it comes to point of sale. Uh, and mm-hmm. there are some platforms up market that have tried to provide some of the, the order management. Uh, Magento has has an order management you know product that they sell to their, their mm-hmm. enterprise users, to the commerce users as, an, as a bolt on. Um, you know, there's there's no shortage of of folks trying to create a secondary product or you know some kind of an integration. But for the most part, I, I can't really think of a platform that handles all of that, at least not not well. <laughs> and, uh, I th- and I think that that's part of the challenge that you see merchants engaged in a lot of integration of a lot of very different systems. Uh, that don't always integrate uh, quite as easily or uh, comprehensively as they'd like because they're really uh, disparate systems and there's a, a, a lot of time and wealth spent on that. Uh, you know, And you wind up seeing 
um, a lot of merchants spend a, a lot of time trying out a lot of different systems to bolt on on top. Um, you know, it's mm -hmm. very, very common uh, to handle things like order management or, you know, things that are going to go outside of the store. So if you've got drop shippers, that's not something that you're going to handle in most e-commerce systems. And a lot of systems, even when they've been growing to handle things like multi-location inventory, exactly. it's still younger. It's almost written, you know, often as a module or a secondary um, and it really was, you know, the platforms all started without it. So their ecosystems as a whole haven't really built around it. And I think that there's still a catch up game. So it sounds like by starting with that first, it gives you a little bit of a, an edge, which is always the fun part in tech that when you have technical debt, when you're starting with something more, uh, more historical, that's a challenge. So if a merchant is already invested into a platform, um, they're already mm -hmm. on, let's, I'll pick Magento out of the hat since for, you know, for anybody watching the video, I'm wearing some kind of Magento orange today that I didn't think about. And <laughs> I can pull it off. I mean, really. No, 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 no. If no, anyone no. can wear We're orange, it's me. Yeah. Uh, we are but, friends with them. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's actually a lot of tech companies that use orange. Uh, my friends at Avalara yeah. would be very happy with my shirt choice today. Uh <laughs> In fact, we have plenty of orange in our own uh, branding also. So, so yeah, it's good. <laughs> All right. See, I, I, uh, Robert for the win today. Um, so let's say they've got, um, their, they've got point of sale already. Does that mm -hmm. create friction for being able to leverage your systems for order management? Or is, it, is hot wax uh, more malleable, um, more or less? Do you have to take on all of their needs or... Can you come in and solve needs more piecemeal and perhaps as they outgrow their point of sale? Because, you know, often companies want to do things in stages that it's very hard to replace your e-com, your point of sale, uh, your all of your you know order routing and everything all at once. That that's a bit of a monstrous task for, for some established companies. Yeah, in fact, you know, because our, our focus is on enterprise customer, mid and, uh, uh, you know, upmarket, big, uh, mid, mid to big companies in enterprise, uh, we are used to working with different applications within your, uh, your tech ecosystem. Uh, to answer to your question, yes, when we go in, for sure, you have your, you know, point of sale system for managing all your brick and mortar. Um, and probably you already have your e-com, maybe running on Magento or on Shopify or something. And then you have challenges. So we bring in our technology to get answer to your real problem, which is synchronizing your inventory across different locations. For example, you know, earlier you said that uh, some of these systems, uh, you know, Magento or some other, you know, uh, similar systems are trying to address now uh, to those multi-location of inventory. Uh, and those things are natural to us. So we bring in the key strength we bring in is synchronizing your inventory in real time. And we would integrate with your point of sale system. Like we have experience integrating with Oracle's X store. Uh, we have integrated with the Microsoft uh, point of sale system for our clients. And then, you know, there are other uh, like, a retail Pro is another one. And so there are like few more, like really major, a lot of, you know, they have uh, many customer, but more they, uh, the, the challenge is that they are on-prem, they are running on the local computers. And that is the biggest problem or cause of most of the problem these retailers are facing. And so they're going to have that regardless of what they integrate with, because that's exactly. just painful. You know, you're dealing with some sort of, uh, you know, a Microsoft, a Windows server running somewhere, uh, centralizing exactly. some data. It's, you know, you're not talking about often very, uh, sometimes there are no APIs. You're dealing with direct to database mm -hmm. or something else that no one really yeah. should be doing anymore if they have a choice. <laughs> So, yeah, that's, yeah, there, there, we've seen sense. all those things. Yeah, we've seen all those things. In fact, you know, we do it all. Uh, we, we go integrate with these system. But, you know, it's only fun when the management has a vision and they see that all these on-prem legacy systems are actually the challenges that they need to solve. They need to move away from and move to something on the cloud, more modern, so that you could actually... 
uh, do the unified commerce in the real sense. Yeah, well, because otherwise, so trying to integrate legacy systems like that to handle online and offline returns, gift cards, um, reward exactly. points, it just becomes so hard to do with systems that really are were never architected um, to be able mm -hmm. to handle those things. And so you wind up writing a lot of middleware, a lot of software to try to uh, to make it do what you want. But even then there can be, because it's not real time APIs and things, it's not necessarily the most elegant solution. Um, I think we actually yeah, fact, covered you know, this in one of the very first episodes of the podcast where we talked about um, data management between systems. And we talked more mm -hmm. about the pros and cons of different styles of flat files or direct to database or APIs or things right. like that. But um, but here it is coming back, you know, 40 some odd episodes in <laughs> that, uh, that those legacy systems where you have to go uh, direct to database and such, they're, they're, they're still the weak link in the chain. Yeah, I know it's it's hard, and in fact, it's not just technical problem, but there are processes problem also, because of these systems have their limitations. Uh, these tech limitations brought in because of the technology, uh, the businesses, uh, all these retailers had to run right. They had to still serve their customers, so they come up with workarounds. For example, very recently, I came across this term. It was it was funny, like verified return. I'm like, what is that? So it's like the customer bought it online on the same day if they come to the store to return it. Because you are a big brand, you cannot refuse your customer. So you take a return on your point of sale in the store, but point of sale has no idea about that sale because it's only at the, on the, in the nightly batch the data would be moved from your e-com into your point of sale. So if you had come like a two or three days later, probably the POS would know about your online sale, but on the same day, it won't know. So there is a business process for, it's not a verified return. I mean, like <laughs> you had to go create these things because of the limitations. Well, there are so many businesses right now that have been moving to variations of in-store or curbside pickup. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, that's really, I think it's shown a lot of businesses in 2020 unfortunately, uh, just how detrimental it's been to have systems that are, are really uh, outdated, that are legacy systems, and that, that don't handle some of these operations uh, nearly as well as a more modern stack would. Uh, so, yeah. you know, there's definitely been movement in the industry of, of businesses that have been putting off upgrades and improvements, um, starting to see a little bit of the light there that it's always a challenge to figure out where to invest in, in your business. But sometimes, uh, you know, it's just like security often gets uh, left behind a little bit until there's something damaging, um, some kind of wake up call. Hopefully it's rather minor and, um, you know, it's it's the wake up call that comes <laughs> that it lets you go hmm. back to sleep afterward. Um, that yeah. doesn't haunt you. Uh, but absolutely. Um, very, very common right now. Right. Yeah. And so. The Hot Wax platform, you know, we've talked about how you've come from this open source environment, but you're providing uh, the new platform, uh, Hot Wax, mm -hmm. in more of a, a SaaS solution. It's it's in the cloud. It's it's reliable for the user. Um, what um, what limitations might be on the customer that they wouldn't have had with an op with Apache OFBiz or something completely open source? Yeah, it's, it could be open source or it could be even like a you know legacy ERP systems or any kind of other system. The problem would be similar. The problem is that you know most of our we've been we are used to seeing customizations, right? Because the the the, the platform was built for generic needs, like it's not industry specific solution. So you you are a retailer, a fashion retailer now. The platform doesn't have the the components built or the scenario supported that fits your business, and that is why you need all those customizations and all those things. And that is when the the exact question that you asked comes up: is like, well, if I go to SaaS, I won't be able to customize. No, how am I going to run? Well, yes, that is a problem with the SaaS solutions, 
but then there are ways to answer it. Uh, how we have dealt with is we are taking one industry at a time. Like, for example, right now we are focused on fashion retailers. The, our goal is to help them uh, achieve unified commerce, unify their online and in-store business on a one unified cloud so that they can provide the true omni-channel experience to their customers, right? Now, what it means is that in the SaaS, you have to be very specific about the solutions you are providing so that you know, you, there's not much need for customization. But in case, because our focus again is an enterprise, uh, even in SaaS, you have single tenancy SaaS and then you have multi-tenancy SaaS. What our approach is single tenancy SaaS. Uh, and which allows plugins and all those things. Uh, so if you have you have a real need for customization, a lot of times, you know, people would have a very specific algorithm that they even want to control. You know, so then, you know, in those cases, we have ability to plug in and that way you could enhance our system to fit your business needs and then you can control it. But that comes because we have single tenancy SaaS platform. So very similar to how JetRails handles hosting, that there's a lot of mm -hmm. hosts out there that offer shared hosting, just like there's a lot of uh, multi-tenant SaaS like Shopify, where everyone's got to get the same base platform because they're all intermingled. Uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, it, nothing is spun up for you specifically <laughs> in, exactly. in relative yeah. terms, at least, uh, you know, that it, in hosting, you know, in a shared environment, uh, in, in essence, you know, you've got to use the same tools as others on that server and, and you can't do certain things that would impact others on that server. Um, and so we take the opposite approach. Everything that we do is single tenant. It's dedicated to the user, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of flexibility and tailoring and optimization and customization and things that come out of that. Um, so, and I suppose that's probably why our, our two companies get along so well. But <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but it's that that theory that, you know, even, you know, for us, when it comes to sizing out a user, we don't care about what their revenue looks like. We care what uh, what the demand on the server looks like, um, mm -hmm. you know, very much the same. You know, there are some that don't ask the right questions when it comes to sizing it out. And at some point there can be bottlenecks or other issues because the environment's not really uh, not really uh, architected to do what it needs to do. So. You're basically looking at a, a merchant, um, mm -hmm. primarily retail in this case. Yes. And yes. starting yes. out with yes. industries yes. like fashion and, and knocking those out. And so you're, you've really tailored uh, the platform around those users. And if they have unique custom needs, modules could be installed, you know, server exactly. side, so to speak, even though it's, it's SaaS. Uh, it's their <laughs> uh, right. It's their instance of the entire platform, and so they're you know it, basically as long as the upgrade path remains, um, they're in pretty mm -hmm. good shape. Right, right. In fact, you know, even the upgrade path, they have slightly a slight control over it. Like you know, not everybody has to upgrade on the same night, right? You know, you could take a little bit of time, few months here and there, and still upgrade. So that is other luxury you have uh, with single tenancy, yeah. Yeah, and you know you've been in the industry for quite some time. Uh, you obviously you chose fashion for a reason as one of the early categories uh, that, that you wanted to support. Um, are there particular reasons in market that you found uh, that that made sense? Was it you know we're people were asking you for things? Was it that s existing systems just didn't handle certain particular needs elegantly? Um, was it that there are just tons of retailers that have gone multi-tenant SaaS with platforms like Shopify and they're missing core components like the order management? Uh, I, I'm going to ask for every piece of proprietary information on the <laughs> spot. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, if all of our listeners are going to sign in, right? You know, we're, we're going to make them sign a release before they tune in. Is that, is that a thing? No, that's, that's not. A thing. No, no. Uh, no. Actually, you know, reality is that we, uh, we ourselves, every listener that you have on, on the podcast, they themselves would endorse uh, because 
the problems that fashion industry has, all of us have experienced ourselves. You know, that's the biggest. Uh, this is why it was so obvious for us to go into fashion. Uh, for example, like, you know, you you take a look, you know, you are checking out the product on your phone, right? You, you get to take a look at the shirt on your phone and uh, you think, well, I know this brand has a store near my office. You want to go there and pick up that item. But that website can't tell you if that item is available in the store. And when you go in the store, you know, uh, this, you go ask us to show the associate that phone, a photo on the phone and say, hey, you know, I want this exact product. They'll take 10 minutes. They'll go back and forth and come back and tell you that, oh, you know, sorry, Robert, I don't have that product here. And then your questions, you could have three more questions, but practically they can't answer any of them. Now, so that is your problem as a customer. Now, take a look at the retailer. They, every, they have like two seasons and many retailers have more than two seasons of product catalogs to manage. They start with like you know full price sale, like you know hundred dollars for a shirt, but like in six or four weeks, six weeks, you get a mail in you know coupon or whatever. Like item is available for fifty percent off, so their inventory value goes down very quickly. So the, the the retailer has their own set of problem. Their inventory cannot hold the value for long enough. Hmm. So. We clearly see that industry gap, that if we can modernize the ex customer experience in the fashion industry, where the customer's experience is seamless for, from their experience on their phone to their in-store experience is connected, the retailer, the store associate would know you. You come in and store associate would know, hey, Robert, how are you? And they would tell you, you know, you checked out this shirt online. We got it. Let me bring it to you. I mean, like how easy it will be, how much, so much, so much fun it will be, right? Mm -hmm. And then they can tell you that, you know, with this shirt, these are the three other products go along very well. So let me come give you a full, complete look uh, that goes with this shirt. So that's the kind of experience you really want. And if you do this, if retailers can do this, they can sell more items at full price. So I think, you know, it, it was so obvious to us that, hey, there's this gap that I myself as a customer of a fashion industry know. I always, you know, and, and, and we have technology to solve for our problem. So this is exactly why, you know, we, we went into this industry, uh, fashion, basically. You know, the, the, the big folks out there like Forrester that look at these problems, I've sat through many sessions on multi-channel, omni-channel, unified commerce, mm -hmm. et cetera. And all the surveys always suggest that the industry knows, you know, retailers and, and other businesses know that they need to do more of these things, but mm -hmm. they never really technologically get there. I think that 2020 is a year that is propelling things forward um, and, and is definitely, uh, you know, <laughs> there's been a, a lot of fuel added uh, to the unified yeah. commerce fire. Um, and that's, I think, a good thing for consumers, really, because that's what this yes. is all about. It's about customer experience and customer expectations. And one cu once customers get a taste of how it could be, you know, it's just like Amazon taught everyone that shipping should be free in two days, that mm. customer expectations are absolutely changed for better or worse. Yes. You know, <laughs> we, we could lament some of it, but it comes back to uh, always to to the shopper uh, in the commerce world. And I, I think that that's, uh, you know, a, a, a core challenge that still needs to be met. And for sure, you know, when we talk about the biggest box stores, uh, a lot of them have been making moves to catch up slowly but surely. They're not all replacing their point of sale softwares and things that are just so unwieldy for them to do. But uh, I think that there's a very interesting mid-market play where there are lots of folks that have, you know, a, a more reasonable number of stores that can more, mm -hmm. more reasonably put themselves on a, and it's not necessarily, a, you know, a three-month or six-month plan, um, but maybe, you know, a five-year plan to deal with their e-com, their order management, their... Um, 
you know, their their point of sale, et cetera, uh, and not ta- you know tackle something every year, actually get it done. How long do you think, um, or how long does it take a user to get up and running with hot wax, at least for one of your, I'll call it, you know, pillars for something like order management? What is a reasonable rollout time? Yeah, you know, uh, again, um, it's a really subjective, right? You would agree, right? It's because it just depends. Like, but like a good time would be anywhere from six weeks to like 90 days, I would say. Uh, we can do it in like, if, if, if the client has a perfect environment and they can have a perfect team supporting us, it should not take more than six weeks for us to implement. Uh, a simple, uh, you know, a get you order online pickup in store, curbside pickup, and all these, you know, key keys fulfilled from the store, all these key things up and running, it should be taking us six weeks, but it generally I, takes like 90 days here and yeah, there. Yeah, I, I don't know uh, if that six the, week, you know, perfect customer really does exist. Uh, I've been dreaming about them for a long time. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we, we've had a few of them, you know, we have had uh, some who have done really good work. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, uh, I would, uh, but then, you know, then most of them end up doing 90 day here and there uh, because, again, like I said, you know, it's like a mid market and a big company. So there's a lot of, you know, approvals that need to happen uh, and do all, do all those UATs and getting everybody to sign off takes a lot of time. Uh, otherwise, like because we are a very industry specific solution, so there's not much to be done uh, on our side. It's more of like, getting plugged into their ecosystem that integrating with the point of sale integrating with the, your wms your erp and all those things it's access and content and data and things that the client is ultimately mm-hmm. going to be responsible for uh, exactly for yeah. providing uh at a high level and then of course you know reviews and approvals and um right you know so you mentioned earlier, you know, things that related to cost and, you know, we know that there mm-hmm. are some very expensive systems, uh, you know, that really target large enterprises and such that are out there. That's often where the market starts with things. Um, you know, Amazon creates a feature and then slowly but surely someone puts out something that's going to be more affordable for, uh, you know, for SMB, for mid-market, for different market segments. When we talk overall savings, are are there legacy systems that you really, uh, you know, compare, compete with specifically, or, or are there, you know, just overall um, savings that you com- often compare yourself with? So to say, you know, there are a lot of users that are spending a lot more for platforms like X, and we we're a more modern stack that does it more elegantly. Uh, I- I'm, I'm going to write your pitch for you. <laughs> uh, I can't help myself, right? Uh, too many years in marketing. But um, where is it in the market that you really see yourself positioned as, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I, I avoid saying disruptor, but uh, really as that, um, as that more modern player? Yeah, you know, uh, can I uh, share a experience that I have, uh, you know? Absolutely so like, not. Uh, no, um, I, I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Can't take me anywhere. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so I was talking to the uh, CIO of one of the, the tier one retailer, right? Mm, big retailer. Um and they were questioning a lot of times, you know, our company is much smaller in, you know, size, I would say, because these guys are used to working with IBM and Oracles of the world. Um, so they were questioning and they would question, ask certain questions that otherwise I would refuse to answer because they're a little too private or something, but, but they're trying to gauge it. So they asked me, like, how much would it cost you annually to host the system on AWS? And to give them an idea, I had to tell them that it would cost us about, on the higher side, about $10,000. And they actually refused to buy our system because they could not believe it. We've had that happen. So we get yeah. to come from some of the, the legacy hosts or some uh-huh. of the really completely enterprise, not mid-market focused hosts. And these are 
places that don't usually spend as much time optimizing and configuring and dealing with exactly. cost savings. And so, you know, we, we've had folks that we put out our proposal based upon their actual data and what their needs really are. And we come in at such a price break for these enterprise users that some of them, it just makes them nervous. And it makes us upset to lose a deal because we, we underpriced it. But in reality, we're not underpricing it. We're pricing it perfectly. Uh, we're pricing exactly. it on need, not based upon potential. I mean, you know, we, we're very, uh, we love working with AWS, the same that, you know, we love working with DigitalOcean and, and we've got our own. Uh, bare metal in our data centers, uh, you know, that, that, that we're operating um, you know, the Chicago area. And, and all that is great. But that's whether you get it from A, B or C, the price is going to be a little bit different, sometimes significantly different. Um, bare metal is usually a, a lot cheaper. Um, but there are use cases where this makes sense or that makes sense. And we're going to walk someone through it and we're going to figure out exactly uh you know how to best optimize with the right caching systems and cdns and right yeah. uh, and so on and so forth and the right load balancing not just adding cpu and ram to solve problems but you know could could a small cluster or a large cluster do better at this than um you know than having these huge mega nodes and things that are are basically just going to bottleneck anyway um and we find that that's an achilles heel in the market um, is that enterprise users are just used to being told spend more as your solution exactly yeah. instead of think smarter uh, and yeah and it's that, that's I think the most painful way to lose a deal is because you right. know, the ones that were priced properly <laughs> right 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 and, and look at where here yeah. one exactly. is wound up not to rub salt in their wounds but um, for anyone that uh, you know, that's familiar with the brand, um, you know, they, I, my understanding is that they've had to file for a form of bankruptcy uh, and that they've mm -hmm. been closing stores. Uh, I hope I'm getting that that right. But, uh, you know, it's difficult for sure when you don't focus properly on uh, on innovation that's going to have net savings, whether that's in upfront dollars or whether that's in, you know, in the aftermath in cutting down your overall support investment or downtime or other things that cost you money, whether it's, you know, hard costs, soft costs, whatever's going on, it's so common. Um, so I guess that that, that yeah. makes sense overall, you know, probably a lot of similar conversations that our teams are having because we target similar markets. Uh, um, so, yeah, so what we've done is we've taken like a different approach to pricing compared to many of other uh, other players in the industry. Um, we we are pricing based on the usage and not on the gross merchandise value uh, of what you're selling. So we, we don't want to take cuts in your profits. And be, exactly for this reason, CFO would love uh, loves us because... What we are saying is we'll charge you for as much work we do. Number of orders that you process on our system will will price will charge you based on that. Also, because our system is such a scales so well that you know from mid market, mid sized companies to large enterprise, the higher the volume, the better price you can get. So that's why you know um, we've been having a really good. Uh, for, for the companies that are really able to understand why we can charge them less and make them successful, uh, they are interested in working with us. But then once in a while, we get come across uh, some uh, some CIO who would not believe that it's possible to run uh, something like our such, something such complex system like ours. You know, or if I had Oracle's money. overhead, I probably couldn't run what you know what you're doing <laughs> at, uh, exactly, at a yeah. more affordable rate and and some of their legacy systems uh they are certainly known for i mean they, they've got some some great stuff of course but they, they're known for gobbling things up and yeah, it's like, uh, the oracle would charge them like, yeah oracle would tell them that something similar to ours would cost them like fifty thousand dollars in hosting cost yeah so like annual 
I mean, like, and it's like a big magnitude, like from 50,000 to 10,000, it just becomes unbelievable. And they think that, oh, these are a small company. They don't know what to do. But reality is the modern cloud technologies, Mm -hmm. the systems that were returned, that were coded, that were built in last 10 years, they are way more efficient. Mm -hmm. They're way more designed for the current technologies so they can do much more for less money. Well, when hosting websites like we do, Blamp Stack platforms, whether it's mm-hmm. WordPress or Drupal or Magento or, you know, so on and so forth, you're, a lot of the weight, um, a lot of the hosting expense is related to the front end of the website. It's, exactly. uh, you know, and I know that, you know, platforms like yours, if I remember correctly, you've got a PWA front end natively, mm-hmm. but that's yes. if they are going to use the e-commerce or or some other um, some other similar application where they are, you know, having a customer facing uh, application coming out of of your system. It's light and nimble. It doesn't need the same exactly. computing power that a traditional front end would. Um, as a web host, <laughs> I suppose we should lament that because uh, that means maybe you know some smaller invoices. Maybe that brings down. Um, some of our our revenue, but you know, at the end of the day, I think for us, uh, you know, it, it's got to make sense. So if that's what helps the merchants, that's what their customers are looking for—a faster, more nimble experience. Uh, you know, we're certainly not standing in the way of it. Uh, you know, we applaud innovation, and you know, we pivot around. In it. fact, you know, in fact, uh, with PWA, the business grows. So the amount of computing, uh, you know, they definitely would need less computing and so less cloud uh, bill if the business stayed the same. But with I, I PWA, want to sound you know, altruistic here. I wanted people to think <laughs> that we were just, you know, sitting on the sidelines. They should feel bad for us, right? No, no, it's it's true. Yeah, well, they, well, they'll make more money, and because they would make more money, they'll feel okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, everything yeah. that what goes around comes around to at least to some yeah. extent. That doesn't mean the technology doesn't evolve and change uh, exactly. and, and that that doesn't have net impacts. But yeah, that I, I think anything that keeps our clients growing and thriving um, generally comes back well uh, exactly. for us, uh, you know, as we continue to service them. So uh, that at all makes a lot of sense from my vantage point and. You know, is there, based upon your your target audience, is there any kind of a minimum or maximum size, some some kind of a starting point or peak uh, that that you think that Hot Wax is really positioned for today? Um, I would uh, say that there is definitely a certain bottom, uh, the lower limit. I would say, but not the upper limit, because we have customer on the higher side. Uh, one of our customers is a big auto parts alliance, and we're talking about like billions of dollars in transaction uh, every month. Uh, one of our fashion retailer uh, has a system tuned to do 20,000 orders per hour. Um, so these are the systems that are designed for like a really good scale, and we can do even more, no problems. Uh, and and uh, but then yeah definitely you know our system would not make sense for somebody uh, who is just doing like few million dollars a year um, but like if you are hitting like 10 million plus and you know you are growing mm-hmm. then our system makes sense because today it, it's like you know to begin with for sure i i'm very confident it it would not be more money than any other system you can buy for even for the small businesses uh, but as they grow, they, their savings would be really good because the system would grow with them. Yeah, and, uh, and let them, you know, ex- uh, yeah, because like, you know, delivering experience is also critical. So that is other thing that, you know, our system has uh, capabilities ready to help you when you grow the complexity that would come in as you grow your business. Our system already has those uh, scenarios already handled. Yeah, I mean, in retail terms, if someone's still comfortable operating a, a kiosk, at, I guess there aren't a lot of malls open right now, but, um, you know, you, you, the analogy will still stand, I suppose. Uh, mm-hmm. Then they're not really ready for, you know, the ability to have their own standalone store. It's just not where they're at exactly. uh, in the experience. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. 
Um, but they're two different markets. Same for us where we don't provide shared hosting and things. We're typically dealing with merchants into the uh, the millions or at least projecting to be into the millions in uh, in online revenue. Um, that someone that's just starting out with, you know, a website with no revenue or, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or whatever a year in revenue, it just, it, it, you know, Jet Rails isn't nearly as appealing uh, based on starting prices and other things because we're providing such a, a strong product okay. and, and support service. So it, it makes sense. And I think that that market segmentation is important. I think that platforms and service companies that try to support everyone um, usually have a, a very difficult time pleasing their customers because they're really different, um, different products, different services, different expectations on market. So that yeah, that makes sense because otherwise you're you're underpricing or overpricing somewhere. Um, it's very hard to have you know <laughs> to, to have that great net promoter score or um, the, those five star reviews or you know however we want to gauge it that great retention when you can't really speak to your market um, and, and address them particularly. So that um, that makes sense uh, in e-commerce. I know, and you know, I, I'm a self-professed uh, partnership guy. So uh, it takes a, a village, as I consistently say on the on the podcast, that you've got you know integrations and systems that relate to you know shipping and payments and uh, you know taxes and all sorts of things. Um, has that? played a role in in your company obviously you know platforms that have yes. been around for years have taken some time to accumulate some of these you know sometimes more than would be ideal i think if you go to an app store like shopify and you try to figure out which shipping system to use it can be a bit overwhelming uh, for a merchant that there's almost uh, analysis paralysis there's a bit too much um, how have you found that to uh, to fit in with your platform um, have there been key relationships that have been forged, um, key systems that that you have uh, have integrated? Yeah, definitely. You know, in, uh, we all live in in this whole community, like uh, your analogy of like a village, right? Uh, we we have to work with the whole community, and exactly like you know the, <clears throat> for example, for computing taxes, you need Avalara. Uh, you know, for shipping, for sure, you you cannot miss FedEx and UPS, and then there are shipping aggregators like Ship Stations and all those providers, right? Um, so we have all these different partnerships that we have. Uh, then there is this, uh, these days, you know, also with the SaaS evolved so much, it's so mature now. A lot of services are available. For example, the search engine. Uh, so we have a partner, Unboxed. Uh, they are specialized in searching. Merchant, searchandising is the new term that I come mm. uh, see often. So those, so there are like many. Also, because we are also have a really good OMS uh, we integrated with the ERP. So we have built integrations with Microsoft ERP, Oracle ERP, NetSuite. So we have ready integration. And this is why we can, you know, promise you much shorter time to market because we have all these integrations and partnerships in place. Uh, but then, you know, uh, yeah, uh, when, when it comes to e -com, you have a lot of like payment processor, the then fraud detection, like clear sale, you need those partners as well. So depending on like oh, what kind of you know um, business requirement we are addressing, different partners come into play. Okay, so definitely a part of the stack. I have seen, you know, there have been platforms over the years that have not necessarily taken that stance, and I think that that's almost a non-starter in the industry that you have to be open to integration um, to meet the customer, the client in this case, mm -hmm. yeah, where they need to yes. be you know, I've brought up a couple of times 2020 and and all the shifting sands underneath all of us. Uh, you know, very mm -hmm. uh, if we ever had a time where we saw that we really can't predict very much of anything, um, this may be it. Have you seen market conditions change your strategy this year? Uh, you know, have have there been any pivots or um, you know, or, or maybe just changes in priorities um, from your team as a result? Uh, yes, yes, for sure. You know, there's, um, you know, this whole situation that we have going has not left anybody. 
So, and, and we, <laughs> in a certain way, it has helped us, I would say, because a lot of those, you know, digital transformation projects that were lingering got moved. Uh, and, and we've seen a lot of demand for like BOPIS, curbside pickup, then ship from store. Uh, so these are the three things that are really, really popular right now. And we are seeing a lot of inquiries uh, coming from retailers in this space. Uh, that's why, you know, in short term, we are really focusing on uh, on providing support for BOPIS, buy online pickup in store, which has a cousin curbside pickup. And then, you know, ship from store, very important, right? Like today, retailers are really having problem. A lot of their inventory is logged up in the stores. Uh, and as and when the uh, environment allows, they are opening up the store, but really customers are not coming as much, right? You don't see customers coming, but you have your <clears throat> associates in there. Customer would order, but may not come and pick up. They want it shipped uh, to their home or they might come and pick up from the curbside. So, con so converting your stores into micro fulfillment center is like a, becoming a key strategy for the retailers today. And in fact, you know, it is also helping them uh, to counter the Amazon's uh, shipping and promise, which is like, you know, next day delivery. Uh, with the ship from store, now you have the elaborate network. For example, like as a retailer, if you had like 150 stores across the United States, it is so easy to, uh, to get item to your customer in like two days or, or one day, right? Because you could be shipping it from your stores. Uh, and we've seen a lot of success and uh, there is one big retailer that uh, is um, rolling out and then there are many more that are lined up and uh, we have like a pretty good pipeline right now just in this uh, buy online pickup in store, curbside pickup and um, ship from store. That makes sense. And I think that's yeah. what a lot of us in the industry are seeing that uh, there have been changes in market because, you know, 100,000 Magenta One users, you know, wound up hitting their software into life. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and retail stores were hit hard and shoppers moved online and, um, you know, and categories that, you know, that that, uh, that were hot slowed down and vice versa um, because, you know, people were home. And so their, their shopping habits uh, reflected that. And. Uh, you know, certainly things that had to do with, um, you know, PPE and other things, uh, you know, I, having a lot of demand. But um, but by and large, I, I think, you know, the sustaining change, uh, you know, obviously we're all seeing people, more people work remote than normal and um, and other things that I think will continue forward to some extent in the e-commerce industry as a whole, that we were already forward thinking as an industry when it came to a lot of that. But uh, it, it's only um, accelerated uh you know the same way that telehealth has been <laughs> accelerated uh by all of this um I, I think that that uh that strategy of of using your stores as fulfillment centers and um and as uh really a linchpin in that entire uh, processing uh order processing system that, that that's uh that's going to be a big deal and you know, anything on the roadmap at this point for 2020? Any sneak peeks or spoilers about what's coming next for Hot Wax? Um, you know, especially the things that um, that, that we're going to keep very hush hush here. That um, certainly, you know, only the well, it's you, me, and the one guy I work with that listens to this. So, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Well, I know uh, as we um, uh, as we get a more you know pass through towards the end of this year, like you know, what we've seen is because of the pivot uh, or or the or the new needs that Bopis and curbside, uh, we are right now focusing on customers that are using Shopify, Shopify Plus, and Shopify Point of Sale. Uh, because in like you know recent times we have seen a lot of enterprise finally have started moving to Shopify Plus or Shopify Point of Sale because they really need cloud 
platform to run their stores. And so uh, in next little bit, we are going to roll out a full deeply integrated with Shopify, a full order management system, which supports all these business scenarios uh, that we've been talking about, like in all these omni-channel scenarios. So that um, the customer can get the view, single view of your company, your product line, and also your store associate is empowered with the real-time inventory, customer 360-degree view. And, uh, you know, uh, so like, you know, they want to be able to take orders right there and then fulfill and all that. So because of that, we, uh, like I said, you know, our SaaS approach is to go focus on one industry. So this time we are saying we are going into fashion, but then let's go address to the needs of Shopify plus customers. I think so that's a up. great strategy. I mean, you know, it's my, and my opinion is obviously extremely, extremely important on this. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, it, it's sought. I mean, sometimes I just stay at the top of a mountain. People, you know, they, they come to seek my sage advice on that. No, yeah. I'm just, no. <laughs> uh, my, my opinion is, is worth just about, yeah. uh, you know, uh, as much as any two other people in the industry, but, um, it's not opinion, actually. It's not your opinion or my opinion. This is exactly how the industry is behaving that, and what right. we are doing. It's data. To the industry. You know, yeah, so exactly. I, I agree that we see a lot of growth, obviously, <laughs> whether you look at the user base or stock prices or other things of uh, of Shopify. Um, I think that it's fair to anticipate more growth there, but it's just as fair to anticipate that Shopify or Shopify Plus in this case will not meet. Uh, by itself, the needs of of a true, exactly. uh, you know, unified commerce or, uh, or or you know, enterprise in general. Um, you know, I, I was just speaking with a well established company uh, about a week ago, and they had evaluated Shopify against uh, an open source platform, and what they figured out was that they needed they would have to write so much in terms of custom apps to truly get the yes. functionality that they needed because it's such an austere platform and so limiting and you can't extend it. You, there, you can't install a plugin. It's all, you know, hitting the APIs and the, and the risks of, um, of, of doing that, of the throttling of the API and other limitations on that. And um, they just knew that they would, they'd be giving up a lot of control for a platform that really wasn't built to do what they needed it to. Um, and that that, wasn't going to be best case scenario. I think what's interesting is that Hot Wax um, has that potential to help bridge some of that gap. And so for users like that, that it sounds like that what you will be coming out with um, addresses some some real market there. You know, it's it is interesting that we do see merchants come back from Shopify today to open source. Grass is always greener. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I've always found is that uh, you know, when you talk to one vendor or to sales rep or someone that you know has a vested interest in selling you something, uh, or only un- or only knows one platform really well, or you know doesn't have the breadth of experience, they're going to push you in the particular direction that that either they're most comfortable in or that uh, that they're most experienced with or what have you. But that's not necessarily looking at the full picture. Uh, so. Very, very common. So, I I like it. Uh, I give it, you know, two thumbs up. If <laughs> like, like I say, I don't think it's worth very much, but uh, but but that's that's my two cents on on that. Um, and, and Shopify I, was I, designed to uh, work for small and medium businesses. Yeah. But now that you know, because they have grown and they become such a big company, the big companies uh, that otherwise would buy from Oracle are. So happy or they are okay to buy from Shopify because it's a big company. It doesn't matter if the product is good or not or helps the complete, uh, satisfies their business requirement or not. Yeah. Important is that that's a big company and it's not going anywhere. So we see opportunity there because we can fill the gap of functionality that is left behind by Shopify. So we bring in that gap, filling that gap, yeah. I spoke with a JetRails customer. I've lost track of how many months ago but they literally said, here are competitors, this one, this one, this one, they're on Shopify. Um, and mm-hmm. so we think we're going to go in that direction because everyone else, you know, that we're tracking yeah. 
in this particular very unique niche, you know, we're talking two or three websites uh, went Shopify. And it's like, well, but, you know, you're bigger and you have these particular needs and you do these things. How's that going to work out for you? No good answers. But, you know, they got in their heads that if others are doing it, that it must be good. And, you know, that's obviously, you know, not the way to to make decisions in business. That doesn't mean that there aren't lots of use cases where it's a good platform. And I don't mean to pick on on Shopify by itself or, uh, you know, they just happen to have had a lot of growth and in some cases more marketing driven than anything. Um, And I, you know, to me, I, I respect the overall market that there are going to be use cases where lots of different platforms are going to be the best choice that they're going to be the winners. And I think that it always should come down to a proper analysis because this software you should ideally be living with for years. And it's going to absolutely impact your success, your, your revenue, your profits. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've, we've touched on a lot. Um, Anil, any final thoughts before we wrap up for the day? Yeah, so, you know, one important thing that I think uh, we all know and retailers need to really get, uh, really grasp on is that the time when customer used to come to your store is pretty much gone. And now it's time for you to come to the customers. And good thing is that they have this phone. So, you know, it's important that retailers think about how can they become one unified company. And uh, so like, you know, sorry, but like, you know, what retailers are doing is they are like, they're they are online and retail business, brick and mortar is competing. It's important that they unify and become one organization and then use this channel effectively to serve their customers because We've seen a lot of those, you know, I think it's called memes or whatever, like, you know, where people now see the world through the phone. So, I mean, you cannot ignore that for long. So take it seriously. That, that's that's what I think, you know, that's my like, man, if I, there's one thing I could, uh, you know, be talking about, that's exactly what it is. Like, it doesn't matter who your vendor is, but, but what is important is that you, you take it seriously. Yeah. That yeah. customers are looking at the world through the phone. Yeah. You know, stop worrying about the n- new shiny thing. Oh, you could ha- you could have some synergized product with this other company that has nothing to do with you or you could and all that's yeah, it's good and well. But if you don't have this right, where are you headed? You know, what's your, your trajectory? Well, you know, to um, to our listeners, as always, thank you for tuning in. I know that there's more than uh, than than three of us that listen to this. So uh, we appreciate you. We love to hear from you. And Anil, thank you so much for joining. Uh, This was fantastic. Always great to chat with you and very excited to see uh, where the future will take hot wax. Uh, You know, I I think that there's uh, just a lot of uh, demand for what you're doing. So uh, with that, um, to, uh, to all of you out there, happy selling, stay safe, stay healthy. And we look forward to bringing you more insights in the next episodes.